So, I don't know if you've ever heard this joke. <laughs> Stop me. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard of it. <laughs> so, a woman walks into a therapist's office, dragging her teenage son. Doctor, she says, please help. My son thinks he's a chicken. You heard me, chicken. <laughs> the son says, if there is one thing that I can tell you about chickens is that we know who we are. <laughs> Where's your proof? The woman demands of her son. You have no feathers. <laughs> True, the son replies. I went through the wrong puberty. <laughs> the woman turns to the therapist. You see what I mean? He's lost his mind. <laughs> the therapist replies. You're the one arguing with a chicken. <laughs> I thought that was pretty silly. This is Irreversible Damage, Chapter 6, uh, subtitled The Shrinks. And this one's all about how the, ther the, the therapy community, the therapists of the, of the nation, is uh, contributing to this whole, uh, you know, whole transgender thing. And I really enjoyed this chapter the most. The other ones have, have been just a little bit like, oh god, what's happening to the world? And then this one's a little bit more like, okay, I feel a little bit better about uh, things. <laughs> just a little bit. And this one's definitely a chapter that I don't really think I summed up very well. I think that the, this chapter really speaks for itself and you really need to read it yourself. But... You know, I will summarize as best I can. Normally, you'd go into therapy to have your therapist, you know, alleviate your symptoms by getting to the root cause of things and then giving you coping, like healthy coping mechanisms in order to maintain your illness, whatever that is. Normally, if you're like a schizotypal, I guess, uh, you would go in, and you really, I don't think anybody with schizophrenia wants anybody around them being like, oh, you know, feeding into the delusions that they see. And it's like they want to know that it's a delusion and not real, because oftentimes it's very scary. So we we would expect a therapist to be like, not, you know, not say, it's not real. They would just, they would try to get to the bottom of it. That's... Normally what we think about therapy in general, but uh, gender dysphoria, especially recently, as of the last couple decades, I guess, has been the only thing where a therapist goes along with a self-diagnosis of the kid or teen that's coming into their office. When it comes to self-diagnosis, like, usually somebody doesn't come in knowing that they have something unless they were previously diagnosed with it. And, like, a, a doctor, uh, you know, a therapist would be like, no, let's actually evaluate what you do have. Because I'm the one with, with uh, you know, the knowledge to back all this up. You don't. <laughs> it's pretty much why we go into it, you know, we want somebody to tell us <laughs> of of um, what's going on with who we are, not to be just affirmed that, oh yes, you do have this, and uh, let's uh, affirm you, like, that's, that's, it, this is, it's just, gender dysphoria and how it's being treated is very unique, is what I'm getting at, and it makes you wonder, like, like, what's the point of therapy if all it does is just affirm what, what your self-diagnosis and all that? Like, what's, what's the point? And the answer isn't extremely clear, but what I can gather is that therapists uh, or the APA, whatever that stands for, I don't know. Abigail just kind of used it and I went along with it. They don't want um, gatekeepers. Uh, mostly because the trans activists don't want gatekeepers. But the main reason why where there seems to be therapy available is so that that kid or the teenager can have a hub of resources. You know, resources for 
uh, surgeon referrals, as well as a place to convince parents of their child of that of that person's newfound identity. This entire chapter made me think, you know what? I don't think anybody understands what gender dysphoria is because if they knew what it was, they wouldn't be dishing out hormones like their candy or, you know, same thing with surgeries, they wouldn't be doing that. I think it's important to note that uh, Abigail points out, she doesn't use the word, but body dysmorphia, we all have it to an extent. And, <clears throat> like, again, she goes, uh, she sympathizes with uh, uh, older trans people, saying that, like, sometimes you do need it. You do need to transition sometimes, but you know, not as frequently as all these teenagers and little little kids going through with it. And so she's saying there's a huge difference between an adult going into therapy and transitioning uh, versus a teenager going through therapy. The affirmative care that is presented to uh, the teenagers, whereas it's, well, she doesn't say, but I'm pretty sure the adults don't get it like this as much. She's saying that, like, when it comes to adults, a th therapists should exercise sympathy, understanding, and respect. Uh, when it comes to the teenagers, like, that sympathy and understanding isn't there at all. It's, like, very absent because all they really seem to care about is, oh, we need to affirm you, and that's it. We need to do this. <laughs> Our jobs are on the line. We can't. What is affirmative care? Abigail compares uh, gender-affirming care with anorexia and internalized racism. And so she brings up an, a girl with anorexia, pleads to her therapist that she knows she's fat. You know, I know I'm fat, so call me fatty. And the therapist is like, you know what? You know who you are. I will oblige, fatty. You know yourself better than I ever could. So... You're right, you are fat. I get it. We will give you a new, a new diet or whatever to make you even more skinny. I, I care about you so much. And then the other example is uh, a black girl. She knows, uh, she knows uh, that she's a white girl on the inside. She goes to her therapist and pleads to them uh, that she's white, she needs surgery to narrow down her ugly nose and uh, whiten her skin. She knows she's white because she doesn't associate herself with black stereotypes. And uh, the therapist is like, you know, you know yourself better than anybody else, so I think you're right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure most of us, knowing how damaging both of these cases are, we would be absolutely appalled if a therapist was like, you know what, you're right. We will make you super skinny. We will make you white. Abs oh, oh. I don't know, man. It just sounds kind of <clears throat> racist <clears throat> as fuck. <laughs> what about the therapists? What are they up to? What are they doing? And Abigail meets up with this. Um, she interviews this one woman, uh, a, a gender expert named Randy Kaufman or something like that. And that's where she gets a lot of this information from, from what the therapists are really doing. So that's where she gets this, this standard of care. Abigail brings up um, what is commonly compared, you know, from gender dysphoric children to homosexual uh, children. One of the major differences between the homosexual kid and the gender dysphoric kid is, and I, I quote, an adolescent who comes out as gay asks her parents to accept her for what she is. An adolescent who is transgender identified asks to be accepted for what she is not. And I think that's very, a very important distinction. And then in my words, from what I've learned so far, homosexuals don't require medical intervention or a major change in how people see them as. Homosexuals only ask to be accepted that's pretty much it. Accepted and not beaten beaten up, you know? Transgender people uh, 
on the other hand, asks for a complete altering of everyone's belief systems, their perception of gender, and the use of their language. And, like, all three of those things, uh, it's a, admittedly a very tall order. Whereas with homosexuals, it's just like, hey man, I exist. That's it. Nothing else. I don't need to police your language. I don't need to make you perceive things differently. I just, I just want to, I just want to live. Abigail also points out, quote, if an adolescent's understanding of her gender may or may not change over time, how can a parent possibly support body modifications? And this is what, like, uh, Dr. Kaufman, Kaufman, um, was pointing out that desistance exists, but it's very rare, is what she was, like, kind of trying to beat into Abigail's head. From, from what I read, that I could be very much exaggerating, but she, she did repeat it often enough to where I can exaggerate it a little bit. Considering the fact that she admits that there is, um, even if it's quote-unquote rare, there is desistance and detransitioning. That's a, poss a real possibility that can happen with these kids, which means we can f we have to factor that into the whole acceptance thing. Because desistance is, is a real possibility. Why does it seem like something that just completely gets ignored in the therapist's office? Which is a very important question to ask. Gender therapists urge that, quote, adolescents know who they are, even if they later change their minds, unquote. And I find this quote to be a little ridiculous because I don't know if I'm using the word right, but it seems like an oxymoron. They, these kids know who they are implies that their identity is stable and unchanging, very secure. But when you change your mind, that's literally the opposite of that. So I'm not, I'm not convinced. And then another quote is, we can't change the mind of the child, so we have to change the body. And I, I really hate that. Like, how does that make sense? Would you say the same exact advice to an anorexic girl? Would you say this to someone who has internalized racism, you know? I, I, I feel like that's extremely unethical. I understand that when we look at some people out there, they look really stubborn, and stubbornness looks like too big of a challenge, and you know what? They might be right, so I'm not even going to touch it. Just because they're stubborn doesn't mean that they can't change their minds at all. When you become uh, around over the age of 30, kind of, although you, your personality mostly solidifies by age 50, so, and then after 50, it's really hard to change somebody's mind, but everybody's minds can change. Like, even when you're that old, you might still have a chance of being able to change your mind on stuff, so I feel like that's what quitters would say. You can't change their mind, so you have to change everything else. I, I, I feel like that's a little ridiculous. And then you have to think, like, what about those kids who do desist? What about those adults that do desist and detransition? What about those people? Do they not mean anything? The ones who desist, they had to change their minds. And maybe it wasn't somebody directly saying, hey, blah, 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 you know, words that make them change their mind. It could have been they were watching somebody else uh, like at a seminar or something or, or you know, a YouTube video or, or a blog post and then they read this person's experience or they just read something in particular that makes them think about gender more and then they're like, you know what, I, you know, I don't think this is me anymore. And that's what changes their mind. Something does it. I just don't like this narrative of we can't touch them. They, they have to do their thing. So with these quotes up in the air, let's dissect them a little bit. So the first one, um, the theory of gender affirmation, this is what these quotes really are. 
Uh, number one is, quote, adolescents know who they are. So let's dive a little into this. When I was growing up, there was always pe adults being, you know, always saying stuff like, oh, when I was young and dumb, when I did this, I was very young and reckless and I drove my motorbike over here and then I crashed. I thought it was a good idea at the time and then that happened. And then I broke my limbs, blah, blah, blah. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure every adult knows that when I was younger, I was freaking stupid. It all comes together making this impression that, you know, when we're kids, we're like, we're like fish out of water and just floundering around and until we get in back into the ocean or the river or something, you know, we have no idea what we're doing. The whole point of being a kid and a teenager is to go through this tumultuous turbulent, horrific, <laughs> horrible <laughs> trial of self-discovery. That's the whole thing. Kids are meant to be experimenting. If they know who they were, like, they would be lying to you. Even if they're very stubborn about, I do know who I am. Like, no, sweetie, you don't. <laughs> because when it comes to our amazing prefrontal cortex that doesn't develop until we're 25 fully it doesn't develop fully until 25 but it's even it's even better when it when you're when you've reached 30. you know the prefrontal cortex kind of i mean you could look it up yourself but it it, it basically kind of makes decision making a little bit more sound and you're less likely to recklessly do something ridiculous. Like, I think we can we can use an example of Steve-O. He was extremely reckless uh, when he was younger. And now that he's 50-something, I don't know how old he is. But, you know, he's, he's, he's getting up there, you know. He's, he's mellowed out quite a bit. And he's a little bit, I don't know how, how mature he is, but he's definitely way more mellow than he used to be. And that's all thanks to the prefrontal cortex, guys. Abigail brings up a personal anecdote of her teenage self desiring for a breast reduction. She had so many problems with the, the big rack, if you will. <laughs> I'm like, meanwhile, I have the opposite. <laughs> uh... Uh, her thoughts were backed up by her friend, which is important to note. And so she goes to her parents with her conclusion and and her reasoning. And then her parents are immediately like, No, <laughs> you can't do that. And then they supply the reasonings as to why she's wrong and why she shouldn't do it. And I particularly liked it when she said, quote, she had neither the money nor the imagination to plow ahead with a breast reduction without her pre uh, her parents' buy-in. So her plan more or less ended there. And I can relate to that very much because uh, my plans for a double mastectomy also ended pretty much right there. And even though I was uh, about... Well, you, you know, 16 through 19, I, I could have had a job and just got the money myself. But I was still a teenager, and it's like, my mom wasn't dumb enough to be like, if you get a job, then you can just pay for it yourself. She didn't say that. So it, it really just ended right there. And even though I got as far as a consultation, it, it just it stopped in its tracks pretty much. And that was, I don't entirely... No, the reason why I could have asked her before I did this, but basically, I'm well. I I'm pretty sure what happened was we didn't have enough money, and also she didn't, she you know she didn't want me to do it, so she she probably also just lied to me, you know, saying we don't have enough money, so we're not even gonna bother. And in my teenage mind, I just, you know, I just I thought she was just being stingy, and withholding you know, very mean and transphobic. But for Abigail's parents, especially her dad, she pointed out, he was saying, you know, very kind and loving words like, there's nothing wrong with you. You look like a woman should, even if you can't, even if you can't see that right now. 
And this gave Abigail a lot of comfort because, I mean, not only was it surprising her dad did that, but also it showed to her, especially on a subconscious level, that, uh, you know, like her dad loved, I mean, obviously her dad loved her and also it would um, kind of alter her perception of men in a really, in a good light uh, that, you know, so she can be accepted by the right man for who she is. That's that's kind of what uh, the impression that she got from it, and and this kind of uh, indirect compliment, I guess, made her more secure with herself, and that's very good. And for me, I don't exactly remember what my mom said at the during the during the time while I was trying to you know being trans and stuff. Um, yeah, I, but I do mainly remember my mom never believed me even when she was playing along. And I would say that her explanation, whatever it was, uh, got into my subconscious and that kind of that stayed with me uh, until I was 19 where I desisted and then detransitioned. The second quote is, uh, social transition and affirmation is a no-lose proposition. And uh, so, Dr. Kaufman uh, says, or proposes that, quote, let's say the child changes names and pronouns, and they go to a different bathroom, and they change their hairstyle and their clothing. And let's say in three years, they start to go through adolescence and puberty, and they decide, you know what, I'm going to go back to being a boy. And then, I, I don't really... Understand. I, I assume when she was being interviewed, she said this really quickly, and they need to sort of transition back. What does that mean? They need to sort of transition back? And what's with this need? Like, if you can acknowledge that they need to transition back, then why don't you factor that into everybody else? Like, what are you doing? I have such a huge problem with her calling herself an expert and everybody else around her calling her an expert. I just, I don't see it here. I, I more, I more see a out-of-touch adult who has no idea what's going on. Because when I desisted and detransitioned, it wasn't a sudden, easy decision that came out of nowhere, like how she implies. It took weeks, maybe months of struggling. I mean, the whole time I was trans, it was, it was a, it was a struggle. But when I was starting to get this idea of desisting, it, it took a long and arduous time to do it. But it does seem sudden when uh, or someone like me, I suppose, just comes out of their room and says, Well, uh, I, I don't think I'm the opposite sex anymore. It, it seems sudden, but it's not. Uh... Well, some people might be sudden, but for me, it wasn't. The irony of her saying all this with confidence is that she admits there is, quote, not a lot of data out there on the effects of social transition on adolescents, unquote. If there's little to no data on this, how could you possibly know what you're talking about? Like, in a definitive, confident manner. I don't think you know at all what's going on. She makes, uh desistance out to be really easy and simple. She's treating gender as if there's no social dynamic behind it. You can't just appear like a boy, go to the boy's bathroom, or enroll in a boy's sports team, and then suddenly not do it. It's, it's not that easy. It's <laughs> When it comes to being trans, you need to make everyone around you believe in your identity, treat you like how you want your identity to be treated, in this case like a boy. It's Difficult to desist when surrounded by other trans teens or adults who want you to be trans, which is one factor that goes into this as well. Not everyone goes through it. There's quite a few cases that I've seen where they do want you to be trans. Desistance is difficult because admitting you were wrong when you were so stubbornly adamant about being the opposite sex is hard to bear, which I can so relate to. That's one of the reasons why I was like, oh, I don't want to. Not only was I so like super prideful of what I um, was trying to achieve 
I did achieve uh, quite a bit. You know, I got to hormones. And, you know, I got my whole school to get on board with me. I got my name changed illegally. And I just, I invested so much into this identity. And that's why it was so hard to be like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not this. Mm. Like with desisting, it's like your actions can make you seem like a traitor and an idiot. Uh, because... The trans community tends to not like those who aren't authentic, uh, those who can't commit to being trans, basically. And when you desist, it makes you just, it makes you seem like, like you're not part of our cause anymore, and you make us look bad, so get out of here. And desistance is also hard when you have. Uh, a partner who's only attracted to you as a trans man or trans woman. It's not easy to desist. It's not just a, whoop, I'm done. Gonna clean my hands out of the, from that and just move on with my life. It's not that easy. Once the, the trans person's immediate environment reflects their beliefs, they'll have a really hard time desisting because as... I hope I pronounce her name right, Lisa Marchiano puts it, quote, our identities are socially negotiated, unquote. So if everyone is treating this person like, or her like a boy, uh, this not only reinforces her perception, but also very quickly she'll see her body as more, as more incongruent than it had, than it might have been before, and a major source of stress, because obviously it's not a boy's body, it doesn't match the other boy's bodies, so this only drives her further to get these surgeries, which appear and surgeries and cross sex hormones, which appears on the surface as if she knew herself all along. So if you repeat a lie enough times, people will start to believe it's the truth. Hence why some people on Twitter will just repeat one phrase over and over and over again. It's like, you know that doesn't actually work, right? It's meaningless. In order to pronounce the truth, you need to actually be telling the truth. Repetition just kind of makes it look like you're lying and you want people to believe it. And so this kind of doesn't really fit in what I was saying, but, uh, but it, w it was in the book. So in a 2011 journal article by a team of Dutch clinician researchers who pioneered the use of puberty blockers, they themselves warned that social transitioning has its had you know has danger attached to it and then me in my opinion i would say it's a very slippery slope like you make them you you allow them to do one thing then they're going to do everything else look up that argument yourself and you'll know what i mean number 3 quote if you don't affirm your child may kill themselves unquote Abigail points out and I, I found this to be really amazing when she said it, is um, that adolescents go through a phase of rebellion for the purpose of exposing the hypocrisy of adults, and they want to do this because if a kid is unhappy with the way that they're being treated, then they're going to strike out, and they're going to do something. And sometimes what they'll do is so major that... Like, they know that this big, huge step in being rebellious is going to get them the attention and the treatment that they want. When a kid asks a simple question like, why can't I, you know, like a little girl says, why can't I play with the boys, you know? Or in the case that Abigail brings up, uh, a 12-year-old Jewish boy persistently asks the rabbi how he, um, how, how is he so sure that Jesus isn't the Son of God? Uh, this kid in particular, and other kids, as I was saying, it's like, their desperate measure to get the treatment that they want, and, you know, the exposure of these things, of these ideas, is killing themselves. Because uh, a lot of kids know that it's a very effective manipulation. I have, in a previous video in this series, have, uh, I cited a website an article that um, was going off on 
uh, how wrong the statistic is of uh, attempted suicide for these trans people. But I'll basically just explain it right now. And I'll, I'll leave a link in the description about it anyway, among other things. Yes, there is a higher rate of attempted suicide in transgender people compared to the general population, which is 0.6%. Uh, but the high percentage of it, which is about like 41%, uh, it's, it's entirely based on self-report. Which, like, self-report can be good, but it really depends on the context. And for this, it's very, like, that doesn't really work. And one of the main things about false report that are inaccurate is that there's a higher potential for bias. So according to VeryWellMind.com, I guess, um, quote, Many individuals are either consciously or unconsciously influenced by social desirability, that is, they are more likely to report experiences that are considered to be social, socially acceptable or preferred. So, that's kind of compelling. With this knowledge, the actual rate could actually be as low as 20% and not 41. Uh, same as gays and lesbians who have attempted suicide. And, and it's also like, they, in this study, it's like, the self-report of the attempted suicide are just, they're just self-harm, non-lethal self-harm. Most of it is, is that kind of thing. Is gender dysphoria really responsible for suicide ideation? So according to Kenneth Zucker, who seems to be pretty big in this community, uh, quote, he, so he says, um, quote, mental health Outcomes for adolescents with gender dysphoria were very similar to those with the same mental health issues who did not have gender dysphoria, unquote. That was according to one of his studies, which I'll link as well. Uh, this means we don't actually know that there's any direct cause of gender dysphoria leading to suicide. In addition, a study published on... PLOS... <laughs> PLOS One, which is a website that also Lisa Littman posted on, so it's, I don't know, it's kind of ironic that this is here. Uh, anyway, so they published, or have on their website, a, a study on, uh, conducted in Sweden between the year 1973 to 2003, reporting that after sex reassignment surgery, quote, Persons with transsexualism, this was a study in the 70s, okay? <laughs> Deal with it. The persons with transsexualism would experience higher rates of mortality, suicidal behaviors, and psychiatric morbidity. You can kind of piece together that sex reassignment surgery doesn't actually tend to do anything. And I feel like when it comes to the trans people, the adult trans people that are on there, like, it might benefit some mar margin of these people, but for most people who think they're trans, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for them. And then in addition to that, there is a leaked report from the Tavistock and Portman Trust Gender Clinic, the NHS, uh, in the UK, quote, which shows showed that rates of self-harm and suicidality, suicidality did not decrease even after puberty suppression for adolescent natal girls. So it, it's very, that's, I feel like that's very compelling evidence that there is nothing supporting suicide ideation and stuff with gender dysphoria. Uh, and then a commonly cited source supporting that trans kids will kill themselves if you don't affirm is um, uh, by uh, a study made by Christina Olson who had quote collected mental health data for kids ages 3 to 12 at an unspecified time after the children had socially transitioned and never looked at the mental health of those children before social transition and so it just kind of already screams bias. Fourth and final quote is 
Gender identity is immutable. You can't convert a child out of their transgender identity. And I, I don't think you can say that and then say in the same breath, oh, desistance is, is rare, but it's possible. Like, and then also say, oh, gender is very fluid for these people. If it's fluid, that's literally the opposite of immutable. Like, come on. Abigail brings up watchful waiting, which is a, a widely successful process, therapeutic process, where the goal is to help a child grow more comfortable in his or her biological sex, which, you know, that's what therapy should be for. Being more comfortable in your skin, you know without having to do anything super major. This is what I wish I had had when I was a teenager. Somebody saying, hey, let's let's have you be more comfortable in your skin so you don't have to cut yourself up and yada, yada, yada. That would have been nice. But for me personally, in place of watchful waiting, uh, I had graduated high school. And even though I had a job, my... It was the kind of job where I, like, I needed to be penned into a, to a calendar, you know, a schedule. And my boss just often wouldn't want me to be at work. I don't really know why exactly, but I can, I could, I could speculate that he just didn't like me. Because of this, I'd spend a lot of time at home. And because I was at home a lot, it, it was just like, why, why am I doing this? Why am I trying to be, why am I trying so hard to be a, a man? All that social isolation proved very effective for me. And it's the complete opposite of social transitioning. Isolated transitioning, it's effective because nobody around you is affirming you. There's nobody around you where you're like, I need to look this certain way. Which is what being trans mostly is, is just appearing a certain way. Meanwhile, when it comes to homosexuality, Socialization has nothing to do with it, and there's a rich history of homosexuality where many cultures intended to repress it. Transgenderism is not among this history. You can't isolate a gay man and, and expect him to come out of it straight, because when socializing, no one is affirming his sexuality, and especially in an environment that doesn't accept him, you think like, why would his homosexuality persist? Uh, Abigail brings up the David... Raymer, Reimer case, and I don't want to explain it. I'll put the I'll put a link in the description telling what it really is. Uh, the problem with this case, though, is that like this case is brought up apparently uh, because it's like it supports the claims of uh, trans activists and stuff, but. Uh, the problem with it, really, is that David identified with being male because he was a biological male, yet socialized as female. I don't see how this is proof at all, because he has always been a cisgender male, and everybody around him was pretending he was female. Uh, so... He had the sex chromosomes to prove that he was male, whereas when you're transgender, you don't have anything biological to prove anything. And he also has the surgical records. Well, not on him, but they do exist. The surgical records of his bottom surgery and um, probably, you know, his top surgery as well. It's not like anybody wanted him to be female. They were just kind of going along with doctor's orders. And, you know, the parents were as desperate as any other parent would be. So, of course, they went along with the doctor with that. Uh, uh, I did. I kind of didn't really want to conclude here. I kind of wanted to... I started thinking about advice for parents because now I know... That there's more parents watching my videos now. I, I was like, as I was reading this chapter, I started formulating in my mind, like, what could, what kind of advice could I say for parents? And so I came up with a couple things. I think the best thing that you could do, and I did have a video on, on some advice, but I didn't include this part because I thought. You know, a friend of mine had told me like sometime last year that it's really hard to 
get a teenager away from the internet and, you know, you know, rip their phone away from them. But then I realized, like, you know, you're a parent. You can do it. <laughs> what What's really stopping you? So um, my advice is get them away from the internet. Anywhere that's feeding them their, these ideas, like their friends at school, the, the school themselves, uh, the therapist, the gender therapist that they're going. Never take your kid to a gender therapist. They're extremely biased. Uh, I would say take your kid on a vacation for a week in a neutral location. And I would say it's probably best that nobody is around. Like maybe go camping, I guess. And just, or, or just somewhere where it's kind of isolated. And hopefully you can do that for maybe a week. But, uh, I would say it's better to get your kid away from these, from this stimuli, uh, for maybe like a month. I think it took me about a month. And with this vacation stuff, like, show them that there's more to life than gender. Because we know that they're obsessed with it, and their whole lives and identity revolve around it. Another point that I, that I think might help is refusing to talk about gender with them. Avoid pronouns and names, unless there's like a gender neutral nickname you could use. Um, if it's at all possible, you could move to a location that isn't quite so liberal. Uh, mostly just stay away from the major cities. I'm sure in your own state there's places where they're not so liberal or they don't even know what transgender even is. You could move there and not even have to move state. My last one is, uh... When you do initially say your disapproval of your kid's gender identity, you have to do it with a lot of love and care. And I say that because your dad was like, you know, you you look like how a woman should, so don't do it. And, you know, there was so much care and love in these people's voices. And, and that was their whole intent is to make her feel better about herself and she doesn't have to change herself. And from my own mom, it's like, she came from a place of love and concern, and that subconsciously got to me. So, for a parent that's going through it with you know with their child, it you you do have to say it in a very loving way. And even if that kid's like, "No, <laughs> I don't want to listen to you. You're transphobic. I hate you." Blah blah blah. It's like even though they're saying that, it's just it's just hot air. It's nothing else. They're, they just... They just don't like it when things aren't going their way. And just because they don't like it and they're having a tantrum, that doesn't mean they're right. Because at the end of the day, teens want your love and protection. Friends don't tend to supply the stability that most parents do. Nor the maturity or understanding... Or the, or the understanding of life. So... It's like, even if they run away and join their glitter family, as I said in a previous video from the series, it's like, at the end of the day, your voice will resonate in their heads. And as long as you are there with open and loving arms for when they do return, like, it, like that really speaks to them. Because once something goes wrong in their friend group, then they can always go back to you. So, and you know, that's how cults work. They want to lure you in with love. And so if you show a bunch of love, then they'll get kind of confused a little bit. But yeah, that's that's what I have for this episode. I, I really encourage anybody watching to like read along with me and like buy her book because I, I can't totally speak for Abigail, she she wrote she wrote it so well. I, I can't really give it justice. I can only g really give my opinion and what I've experienced myself. So, yes, uh, I will see y'all next week at some point, probably the same time. Uh, yeah, goodbye.